Hey, everybody. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. We're probably going to start right now, or it's probably a good time to start because we're five minutes behind and we all want to get to the after party. So, let's just wait for those people to do their thing. Hey, everybody. Um, so, this presentation is about uh, local Drupal 8 development. Um, as maybe you could tell by my slideshow theme, I'm super inspired by it and jazzed by it. I hope you guys find the slides funny and not annoying. Um, I did this very late last night, so let's hope it all goes great. Um, okay, so uh, my name is Nick Gajewski. I'm a senior developer at the Ontario Digital Service. Um, so some introductions. My name is Nick, senior developer at the Ontario Digital Service. Um, I've been Drupaling for about 10 years now. Started at about 5.4. Um, between then, I've jumped between a whole bunch of technologies from Flash to Python, uh, Django, JavaScript frameworks. So I was a front end developer. I always keep returning to Drupal because um, it's the best. Um, I work for the Ontario Digital Service. Um, if you were here this morning, you heard um, our um, CDO uh, speak, Hilary Hartley. We're all about doing things um, simpler, better, and faster. Um, come talk to me afterwards if you want to know more about us. Um, let's talk about why, um, why local Drupal 8 development is tight. Um, it is, it's wonderful and um, I thought of this presentation for two reasons. One, um, <clears throat> kind of as a junior developer from a long time ago, I remember like setting up a local environment was really difficult. Um, you know, you'd have weird inconsistencies between you and your fellow developers. Um, so this talk is about <clears throat> a little bit about how to how Drupal 8 and some technologies um, help make that really nice and uh, pleasant. Um, it's also about I came I thought of it because I now sort of manage a small team. Um, I have about five well between three and five junior developers working with me so um, some of the techniques here help us all just um, you know stay in the same stay on the same page and um, avoid headaches. I want to give a shout out to my brother from another mother, Rolo Henry. Um, he's going to be doing a talk tomorrow, which is a companion piece to this. Basically, everything we do locally, we give to him, and he takes it and through CI and CD throws it into our staging environment and to our production environment. Um, we do we do kind of like a roadshow every now and then um, at the ODS where we go to other parts of government and tell them we do like. We've done like 40 um, production deploys in the last six months. Our um, production pushes take like between three and seven minutes and we blow minds. Um, so he's gonna talk a bit more about how we do that stuff. Okay, so topics. Um, we're gonna cover uh, setting up a local Drupal environment. Um, we're gonna talk about configuring uh, your local environment for development. And we're going to talk about um, site configuration management. Um, and I think with those three topics, you should be pretty good to go um, for local Drupal development. So um, setting up a local Drupal uh, 8 environment. Um, the big concept here is that uh, local Drupal development doesn't have to be a pain in the butt. Um, I'm talking to you, Zamp. I'm talking to you, Mamp, and Wamp. If you guys have been around for a while, you may know these technologies. Um, they were good, but I spent so many, so much time like editing vhost files and setting up all this junk just to get a Drupal install working. Um, wasted days of my life. Um, and I tell you, those days are gone. You can actually be productive. Um, also, I spent times, you know, with building my own virtual machines and the Acquia dev stack and things like that. Um, I want to talk about one thing that I'm really jazzed about right now, which is Drupal VM. How many people have you are using Drupal VM? Three, four people. Cool. Hey guys, some of my junior devs are here. Um, yeah, Drupal VM is amazing. So Drupal VM um, stands for uh, Drupal Virtual Machine. It is the easiest and fastest way to get a Drupal development running locally. Um, here are the four steps to set up a Drupal Virtual Machine locally. One, download Drupal VM. Two run Vagrant up from the command line. Three, go make yourself a coffee or a sandwich. It's late at night, grab a beer, whatever. It takes about 10, 15 minutes. Boom, four, start Drupaling. It's that easy. Um, basically, all of my team has had a pretty seamless experience with Drupal VM. Jen, would you say that's true? Nodding yes. Um, 
On a Windows machine, um, there are uh, a couple of things you might want to consider. Um, I'll mention that briefly at the end. But if you're running um, OS X, it's literally that, and you're up and running with a vanilla Drupal install. Um, so number two is assuming you have VirtualBox and Vagrant installed. Those are also really simple installs. They're stock installs. There's nothing crazy going on there. Question? So, so no VirtualBox or Parallels? Uh, sorry, so VirtualBox. Okay. Yeah, so I just meant it. So VirtualBox is the only th piece of technology you'll need. Oh, and Vagrant, because you want to use the command line, um, and you want to use some of the benefits that Vagrant gives to VirtualBox. Oh, and feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I won't get mad. I'll happily answer, answer them. Um, so if you run uh, Vagrant up, um, you uh, will get this, uh, I actually forgot to include this, but from the command line, you'll, it'll tell you where to go. Um, it'll say like, oh, go to DrupalVM.test or DrupalVM.local. Those things have changed, but um, you'll get a little dashboard like this. Um, it's a lovely little dashboard. It tells you information about your um, local host. Um, there's some other things that we'll mention here as well, but you can see here it talks about MySQL, it talks about MailHog, uh, PimpMyLog, Adminer, things like this. These are tools that are packaged with Drupal VM, which are super powerful. Um, you also get uh, easy access to your virtual machine via Vagrant SSH. So, like, you know, beginning of the day, if I'm building something, I just type Vagrant up, it does its thing. Um, it doesn't take 10 to 15 minutes every time, just that's the first time. It takes literally like a minute. Then you type Vagrant SSH and you're free to do command line things on your uh, box. Cool. Um, the beauty of using Vagrant um, is that you can configure your virtual box with a YAML file. Um, so, um, I love these birds flying by the way, it's very freeing. Um, so, I'll, I have a few snapshots here from the config uh, uh, from the config.yaml file. So, for example, if you want to choose a specific uh, Ubuntu to install or any kind of operating system, it's uh, just a matter of filling in um, the line here. If you want to, um, which you probably will want to, sync your folders to, let's say, a local Git repo, um, it's just a matter of filling in a few values in a YAML file. Um, if you want to switch between Apache and Nginx, Again, just simple as changing one uh, string. MySQL or Postgres, not a problem, one string. Um, in fact, um, the project that we're working on right now runs on Nginx and Postgres locally, and no problems. I can't imagine trying to do that with a XAMPP um, install. I think it would just be a big pain in the butt. Um, lastly, um, I just want to draw your attention to these installed extras. Um, so um, out of the box, uh, you know, uh, Adminer is installed, so that's like a, um, what was it, uh, PHP MyAdmin, so a database tool, a GUI database tool. Uh, Drush um, comes along, MailHog, which allows you to intercept uh, emails from your um, virtual box. PipMyLog is logging software, and then there's a whole bunch of other things here. Um, if you want to install any of these, it's simply a matter of uncommenting these lines. Um, well, okay, there's one more thing you may have to do, which is called Vagrant Provision. Not a big deal, but it's really, you don't have to worry about anything more than that. You don't have to get under the hood any more than running commands at the terminal. Um, in fact, uh, one thing I had to do, which I think uh, I wouldn't have been able to do a long time ago, which is I, I had to build a queue worker or a, one of uh, our products. They, they wanted um, an email digest to be sent out uh, for our um, user base. So the email digest would check Elasticsearch. It would then build a queue worker. That queue worker would then send emails to anyone who's interested in specific topics. Um, sounds like a really big deal, right? Um, with a setup like this on Drupal VM, I was able to do that all like locally very easily. Um, just one note, I didn't actually use this Elasticsearch because we were had a different version, but I was able to look at my database, find out if the queue worker was being initiated cor uh, correctly. I was able to... Um, with MailHog, intercept all the emails that were being sent and, you know, do all that stuff, all that debugging. Um, it was awesome. Something that would have taken months took, like, a couple weeks to do. It was great. Um, summary of that, um, I'll just say that um, use Drupal VM. It's wonderful. Um, and the way you can uh, keep all your developers in line um, or, or together is um, share your config file. Um, this could be kept in a wiki or your Git, Git repo, somewhere like that. Um, and um, yeah, and everyone's going to be happy all the time, except maybe Windows developers. Um, I did, one of my juniors, junior devs um, had some issues with Windows. We got around those by using uh, the Git bash. 
um, shell and with the git bash shell if you run it as an administrator you end up getting through some permissioning issues on Windows. Questions about that? Cool. Um, note about Lando. I think in the write-up for this I was going to talk about Lando. I'm not going to talk about Lando. Um, I got really busy. Um, it's my girlfriend's birthday tomorrow, so I've been running around Toronto um, buying all kinds of gifts. And before that, I was at a cottage and uh, camping. So, sorry. Um, although, I do, people that I respect talk a lot about Lando. Um, the interesting thing about Lando is it's Docker based instead of virtual machines. So, if you're running something really intensive, um, Lando might be the way to go. Um, and our DevOps team really likes the sound of Lando. So, I think that's something I'm going to explore later on. Um, configuring your local uh, environment for development. So when you're developing locally, you obviously want certain things turned on. Um, let's go over what some of those things might be or how to configure those things. One is um, you want to set up um, settings.local.php. Um, so settings.local.php configures your local Drupal install with developer-friendly settings, um, like disabling certain caches and aggregations. Um, it also allows you to share other settings with your local development team. Um, to use this feature, you can follow the instructions on top at, um, at the top of example.settings.local.php. Sorry, that's missing a local there. Um, so let's take a look at this file, the file that you would create from example.settings.local.php. At the bottom of it, you can cut and you can paste a piece of code like this. And so this has connections to your database. Um, you can see um, synced configurations there. You can see the uh, sync development is set to true, while sync production is set to false. We'll talk a bit about more what that means later on. Um, you could set up like Elastic Cloud keys there. Um, this last piece, the Drupal root and the Kint stuff. Um, does anyone use Kint in Drupal 8? Yeah, so you might, you might come across this issue, which is like, um, uh, it, uh, it like errors out and says you can't uh, kint a blacklist function. Um, this gets around that most of the time, not all the time. You'll still have them occasionally. It's a weird Drupal 8 thing. One of my little pet peeves with Drupal 8, which I love otherwise. Um, but yeah, so what, the idea is that with this file, um, you can either commit it to your code base or again, share it in a wiki, share it with all your developers, and then you all have the same settings and no one's like, why is this not working for me, or why is this working differently for me? Um, as part of um, this whole uh, setup, uh, when you do the settings.local.php, when you set that up, um, it enables this other feature, which is development services.yaml. Um, um, it currently requires one edit because the Drupal community is arguing about a comment again. Um, another little pet peeve I have about Drupal 8 is there's lots of little bugs that remain in it and I go and find the patch on Drupal and the reason it's not um, committed to core is because people are arguing about a comment. It's kind of annoying, but it's fine. Um, so what, if you go to this file, you'll have to add these three lines of code um, and this helps with local debugging. Um, so you could set uh, local debug, uh, twig debug to true. Um, these last two I haven't quite got to work, but I'm not sure why. Um, but it's supposed to um, enable auto reload of twig files instead of caching them. Um, and when you set up the first one, um, twig debugging, you can open up your console in Chrome and you'll get stuff like this, so messages like this. So if your front end developers are thinking or what asking how, where, like how do I theme this? Where is it coming from? Where is this file? Um, basically, every template comes with this bit of code above it. Um, so I'll just move away from the mic here and just point at this for a sec. But so you can see that here, it's telling you which template file is actually being used. So very handy for front-end developers if they're like, if they're, you know, because Drupal can be very confusing with lots of lines of code. Um, it also gives you template suggestions. So if you want to override this with something else, it'll tell you what to name that file. And then if you clear caches, uh, Drupal will grab that new file and use it. Cool. Um, summary from this section. Um, so share or force commit your settings.local.php file. Normally settings files are ignored um, by Git. Um, or you could share it in um, your uh, wiki and then make three lines of, uh, change three lines in developer settings.yaml. 
Um, okay. Lastly, um, we'll talk about site configuration management. Does anyone use the site configuration management tools in Drupal 8? Does anyone? Yeah, stuff like that. Or do you use like splitting and things like that? Okay, we'll talk a bit about that here. Um, so Drupal 8 configuration. Um, Drupal 8 comes with a really cool tool where you no longer have to use features. Um, he, basically, um, it's a configuration management tool, um, and it allows your sites to uh, sorry, it allows your sites to store database configurations in YAML files. Um, so the neat thing about this is that you could see if your configuration is out of date by uh, comparing it with a YAML file. Um, and you typically set this on install. You set wherever your sites directory is, and you can export your database configuration into YAML files. Um, so for example, here's something um, that I sort of uh, got from one of my sites. Um, so this configuration tool is telling me that um, the configuration that I have in my YAML files does not necessarily agree with what's in my database. Um, and you can see here it's pointing to three specific things. So three different node types. Um, their displays are different in my local setup versus um, what they should be in the YAML files. Um, if you click on these view differences buttons, you actually get um, like a uh, diff of the two. So it tells you exactly what's different. Um, and of course, the advantage of this is you can commit your YAML files to Git. So I can share my YAML files with everyone on my team, and we could immediately find out why your site might be acting differently than mine. Um, okay. So. That's great, but on its own, it has pretty limited functionality. Um, luckily, the community has stepped in and create, created three excellent modules to extend this. Um, here they are. Um, one is the configuration installer module. So this module adds um, another step to the Drupal installation process, which allows you to uh, install a Drupal site from a config. Um, this is something that I think might be brought into core by like Drupal 8.7. Um, again, there's some debate about uh, some of the nitty bits, but uh, it's going to be there soon. Um, so this is if you if you're not at the point of like let's say sharing databases, if it, if you're if you have a pretty uh, nascent site, um, you can share. You can have all of your development team quickly uh, boot up a site and start working. Um, the configuration split module allows you to partially or completely split configurations as you wish. Um, usually you want to do that around, or I do that anyway, um, along environment lines. Um, the config filter module is a dependency of the config split module. Um, I've never really interacted with it, uh, but think of it like as an API. You can't have one without the other. You need both. Uh, both have been like incredibly stable for a very long time. Like I think the last time a bug was reported in any of them was a year ago. So. They're rock hard, rock, rock study. Um, so here is the a configuration split from a project I'm working on right now. So you can see that I have a sync development folder and a sync production folder. Um, in this particular case, I'm working locally. So you can see that my sync development um, folder is, is active while my sync production uh, folder is inactive. And if you remember that, uh, well, maybe I'll just go back to it. You can manage this via this. So you can see that my sync development status is set to true, and my sync production status is set to false. So if you share this with all your developers, you know they'll have the exact same settings that you do. Normally in the past, you'd have to like ask for a database from someone, and then when was the database snapshot taken, and it's kind of confusing. Um, this eliminates all that. Um, okay, so here's where we were. We're looking at sync development. Um, and uh, the way that I've set these up, and I think this is pretty uh, standard, is again, you have a different sync for each environment. Um, currently, my setup for the sync folder has the majority of everything. It's the meat and potatoes of my website. Um, yeah, th and this is typically what I would use for like a development environment or staging environment. You know, those are just standards. Um, typically, this has 900 files. Um, it's kind of huge. This system is a little bit bloaty, but again, the ability to control your configuration in code is important. 
Um, sync production um, sits on top of my sync, uh, my sync, and basically what that has is just slight changes to those files. So maybe like Google Analytics um, keys are different, or maybe an S3 bucket has a different address. Um, basically, it just has slight modifications on my sync folder. Um, lastly, we have uh, sync develop or sync development. Um, Similar to sync production, this sits on top of sync and has overrides for local developers. Um, this is slightly bigger on, on my project right now. It's about 20 files. Um, and this, uh, like sync production, it changes things slightly, but also exposes a lot more stuff to local developers. So, you know, you, you have different develop settings there. You may, um, if you have an SMTP server, you might set it to, you have to set it to PHP mail. So your mail hog will be able to catch things. Um, you obviously set uh, you know display system errors and you can set permissions to say for example anonymous users can see all error messages which you would never do on a production site um, but with this override um, and the fact that it's um, you know set in your settings file it's just there and all your local developers have it um, so summary of this section I would say um, leverage uh, the configuration installer, configuration split, and configuration filter modules uh, to help you manage all your environment configurations. All right, well, that's it for me. It seemed to have gone really quickly. Happy Drupaling. Any questions? Yes. Uh, quick question. I'm not saying this to start a flame war because I can go either way. Sure. But. Um, have you guys tried Docker for Drupal? All it is is a set of Docker files that download different machines, Apache machines, USB machines, what have you. We need to try. Um, I think in terms of developer friendliness, it's easier for a Drupal, like a single, singular Drupal VM than having developers <laughs> learn all the Docker <laughs> stuff. Um, we even tried creating like a like a sandbox that was all container based and it was just too much overhead for the developers and additional overhead for DevOps to be like a wrapper to make that simpler for them. Where it's interesting that Lando could be a possibility, but also in terms of you know work in terms of DevOps, it's Vagrant is closer to how we deploy. So we don't have Drupal in Docker, so there's no point in running it in Docker right now until we fully get to a completely container I think, yeah, we, we, we played around with Docker and we found that it wasn't ready for and production for Drupal. That I totally agree with, except I've tried Docker for Drupal and Docker-based systems and operating systems like Ubuntu and what have you. It runs far better because it's native Linux, yeah. rather than if you were to run this kind of Docker stuff on, on Mac OS. Yeah. Well, I think the only recently Mac or Docker for Mac has improved, but yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think like, yeah, and uh, the other thing is having um, like front end developers and junior developers also learn some Docker wrapper commands is rather complicated. Like, you know, I, I, like on the whiteboard at work, I often have like the, you know, Vagrant, Vagrant up, the uh, Drush CM, like I have to like Drush CR, like those are, I think we're at that stage for um, younger developers um, rather than like learning extra commands which sit on top of your commands that you would run anyway. Like um, at, at, at my organization for several projects, I did set up Docker for Drupal, and we do use it, except the wiki for getting started is like a 14-step kind of thing, and these are devs, and even still it's kind of sometimes difficult to wrap your head around why I'm running this command and what happens if it screws up. Yeah, and I think that's why I'm so like enamored with Drupal VM, because I like, again, like those four steps, nine times out of ten is all anyone needs to get things up and running. Which I think leads me to the next question. Um, I played with Vagrant for Drupal in a Windows environment, mm -hmm. but there were many performance issues. Um, have you guys run across that kind of thing? So yeah, actually we have. Um, my team uses um, Macs, um, and we're the Ontario government. We got like some really nice Macs lately. <laughs> we recently got some too. It, it was the last thing we'll get for a long time. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. It took us three uh, years. Yeah. Well, that, well. Uh, the funny thing is, the, the the development team was all using their own computers before that. Um, so uh, for OS X, especially like the last two generations, no problem. Um, we had someone join our team who was using a Samsung, 
um, like Windows based machine and yeah he had significant issues with um, some of the configuration management and importing and exporting um, whereas the person sitting beside him had no sex and they were both tasked with like I'm like all right guys like uh, you know I made a change like make sure you upgrade update and everything you know one guy was done in a minute and an hour later the Samsung was still chugging along trying to get this thing done um, so there might be some performance issues on Windows machines a suggestion to um, the sharing, uh, you know, from not the configuration, but the, from content from one local machine to other, and vice versa. Well, um, yeah, the, well. With the config installer, like I would recommend that like at the start of projects when things are still pretty bare bones and you don't have any like say production content there, the config installer works great because you could just create like lorem ipsum content. Um, for our project, I think we did that, f well, we did that for about three months until we started getting significant content in from production. At that point, um, we set up like um, uh, SQL dumps and we would import those. Have you tried using like modules like Content Sync? I have not, I have no experience with Content Sync. So you, just, you guys just do a database dump from production to... Yeah, it works. There was one with Drupal 7, or I can't remember if it was Drupal 8, but it, it might be something similar where it remember dumped like nodes as PHP, and then we tried doing that, but we deal with so much content, it, it's just easier to do an SQL dump. Yeah, like uh, I think the, uh, our, um, our dump last time was like uh, half a gig, and it was still like a cinch to import. Um, is very straightforward. And the neat, the neat thing about that is, so after you do your import, you do your Drush CIM, and it'll override anything you got from production with um, local settings, local settings that you need. And of course, we sanitize all our information before we share it with our local developers. Any other questions? All right, cool. Well, thanks for coming out. Um, and hopefully see you guys at the rec room.